Hello. Greetings. <laughs> so is, we're getting through Slaughter Dick. We're almost to the end. <laughs> There's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Hi, Doug. Hello. Hi, this Doug. An exit door to the sphere. Hi, Doug. All right. An emanation from. <laughs> <laughs> we get emanated and then we get reflected back, and it seems there's there's no escape, or is there? I think Aurobindo is our escape. (laughs) (laughs) The only way out is through, though. We have one chapter left to read and one chapter left to discuss. Uh, And I did go through and get through the chapter. Wow. I had a pretty long night. (laughs) You read Schlotterdijk at night? Oh, yeah. To me, he's a daytime author. Well, I, with a lot of coffee. <laughs> I've I tended to. You do at night. I've tended to procrastinate, perhaps not procrastinate, but uh, be occupied with other readings and even be, feel more compelled uh, by other readings. I'm, I'm not sure how inherently compelled I've been to read this material. So I've been leaving it to the days just prior to our talks and ingesting the chapters whole, uh, just sucking them in with big, you know, blow dry vacuum. (laughs) (laughs) Like a milkshake. (laughs) Right. A a thick, a thick fatty milk milkshake. I like that one better than climbing Mount Everest (laughs) 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 during a blizzard. Uh, well, uh, for the sake of our viewers and listeners, let's just mark that where we're at in this series of conversations now on Peter Sloterdijk's Spheres Trilogy is in volume two, uh, Globes. And today uh, we will be discussing, I hope, we'll see, uh, chapter seven, how the spheric center has, law, has long distance effects through the pure medium on the metaphysics of telecommunication. And, uh, well, I was thinking about how we might begin the call, and I was feeling a sense of some pang of scholarly uh, responsibility to <laughs> at least, uh, you know, retrace the steps that Sloterdijk takes here, the story that he tells, put it out so that we can talk about something objective uh, and then go wherever we, we might go with it because there are lots of places to go. And I don't know how compelling the metaphysics of what he's actually describing is. Um, be uh, curious to hear what you all think. Um, and, there are also these other questions around Sloterdijk, uh, which um, come, up, come up not just not in the reading per se, but in some of the, the discussion around uh, his work, uh, his role as a, as a thinker, as a cultural figure in, in Germany, uh, in Europe, and here now uh, in the Anglophone uh, world. And so, Doug, you posted that article from the New Yorker, that interview, the piece uh, uh, from the the New Yorker. Hey, TJ. Hi, TJ. Good evening. I was just rapping a little bit. Um, You're in the dark, TJ. Yeah, I noticed that. I'll fix that in a minute. I got to jump up in a minute for my son. So, (laughs) Kind of green, too. You have a green background. Yep. You can hear me. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that New Yorker uh, piece on, on Sloterdijk, which uh, you posted, I, I thought... Was Did anyone good. have a chance to listen to that? Or, or read it, actually? I listened to it all the way through. It was uh, 
well read and uh, so it was an interesting it was a bit of an eye opener in some ways about slur i mean I, we we kind of knew some of that stuff but it was presented in a little bit more detail than i've heard before and mm -hmm. so it's a good inside account insider's account yeah uh -huh. i thought so and like you said it was well rounded kind of both the pieced four, together a few missing both for and against in a way i mean it it, it, it gave me a little bit more insight into the against side of things mm -hmm. <laughs> So this article is titled, A Celebrity Philosopher Explains the Populist Insurgency. And this is in the New Yorker magazine, 2008, uh, February 26, 2018. And it's on the forum. Um, but yeah, so how, how are we all doing? How was the reading for you all? I mentioned that I did it a month in advance and um, I did not read bubbles. I, I kind of am going back and forth or I, I was, I, that, that's become a major project. So uh, bubbles had ceased, but I was very interested in the, the core formation. And I think we reached that at chapters five and six of this book. And now I feel chapter seven, that this on the met metaphysics of telecommunication, I feel the met actual metaphysics is exactly what was discussed in chapter five, but now it's kind of branching out and rather than just an idea of God or an idea of the spheric center. Now, now the, the, the radiating emanating rays are the messengers um, in this chapter. Um, but yeah, now, now I'm understanding where everyone is coming from in these past conversations of saying, so what's next? Uh, what, let's get to the point here. And, so I, this chapter, I was saying, well, yeah, maybe the first fifty pages was enough, and it yeah. was very extensive. So I, I'm I'm starting to join that that pack of wolves that want to devour Slaughter Dyke and <laughs> tell them, like, <laughs> let's let's uh, keep it short here, buddy. <laughs> Say your last words. Those are my last words, by the oh. way. Well, well Jeffrey, uh, you, it sounds like you uh, were reading this chapter in perhaps a similar environment to, to the ones that uh, Sloterdijk uh, frequents. Uh, I, nice I restaurant. Think, I think that's of, the way to read this guy. <laughs> <laughs> a bottle of wine right next to him. Uh, <laughs> um, I find it really difficult to read his books at night um, because I don't have really good reading light in the house. So I usually read at night on the iPad and I don't have an e-version of his text. So I have to read it in the daylight under, you know, under an, uh, an ambient light. And also I find it really needs, it really needs to go out and be in the company of others to read it rather than sit alone at home trying to get through it. So I tend to go out to a, to a cafe and read it there. So I've been doing that over the last three days and it's a nice opportunity to go to a cafe and a restaurant or whatever and stuff. So that that's what I was doing. But uh, I'm like like often with Slaughter Dick. I found it interesting. I there are I found it long winded, definitely. Um, but in some ways, I found it a little bit less long winded than Chapter Six. Say, um, because I mean. Chapter five or six had long sections, sections that were incoherent or that we had trouble understanding. This one was, there were a few areas where it broke down for me. This uh, thing about Rosenblutz or whatever it is, I didn't follow that part or certain things, but most of it was a coherent argument that I could follow. I do find him quite quotable, so I have lots of quote of of sections that I've picked out for, for that might find a way into my, into my books. But uh, um, so I, 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 I still enjoy that part and I did enjoy the general argument, but I'm getting tired of Slaughter Dyke. I'm ready to get through this last bit and put him to some, to one side for a while. <laughs> so. I know for me, trying to read Slaughter Dyke, I, I feel like if I was in a cafe or whatever, I would somehow be making others suffer just by simply reading in the, the same 
presence of other people. So yeah, for me, actually nighttime, the, the poetic feel, the, the kind of, <clears throat> I don't know the exact word I'm looking for, but uh, we, we've mentioned it before that this is kind of something you absorb and get the picture, but it, it's not straightforward. So it, it, it taps into a different realm of thinking for me. And that's, that's my nighttime thinking, the, the dream-like flow that he has at times, at least kind of, yeah, I've got to, got to do it at night and, and in little bits and pieces, I can't just sit and read the entire thing. I think it's an expansiveness and there's a sort of billowing quality. It's definitely yeasty. You know, it has this way of <laughs> inflate, self-inflating into odd shapes and uh, kind of these knotted doughs, perhaps uh, flaky, uh, buttery. I, it has these qualities, which I, I don't know. I, I, I would like in either environment, I could, I could, the, the thing is, it's so long, I would be quite intoxicated if I were drinking wine uh, with, with this material. Uh, so, so I think I, I, I've, uh, uh, you know, I've tended to want to give it kind of long spaces of time where, where I could read a, a passage, get up, do something else, come back, read another passage and, and piece it together bit by bit uh, uh, because it is heavy uh, in, in a certain way. It's, it's odd. It's a, he's, he's an odd writer because he's heavy and he's light at the same time. He, he does some of the things that like you know, a Nietzsche could do with, with this the way that he could at least proclaim, you know, claim that he made the German language dance. Uh, there's that aesthetic quality, I think, uh, and the playful quality as well to, to Sloterdijk that I appreciate. Uh, but, you know, one has to be in the mood uh, <laughs> for that. Uh, and if it's, if it's a chore, if it's something to get through, then it's, it's, it's not as enjoyable. And I really, I would rather get to the point. Uh, the whole bit about the tiara, uh, I read it aloud, and I couldn't believe how um, uh, just arrogant and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, decadent I sounded. Like, it, like I, I heard myself reading his words about these papal crowns, and I felt myself becoming completely um, uh, just obtuse and, and disconnected and, and uh, false. It was odd. Uh, it was just an experiment in, in like reading because uh, everything else I just tried to absorb by, by, you know, visually. So he has this weird effect like that. He, he really touches on many different registers and keys. I, th I think he, as a writer, he's, he's, he's interesting as a thinker. Maybe, maybe he has, you know, some limitations. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't want to pass judgment. At, uh, really. I, I want to let it unfold. And maybe he seeks to irritate, you know, I mean, it may be that's part of his credo or his way of working is to try because, because I agree that chair that was extremely irritating. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was kind of funny in a way, but it was obvious funny. I mean, it was too obvious in a way. You know, I, so. I think Ed said, beware of Germans who think they're funny. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Ed did. I think I may, I hope, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but, you know, I don't know. I think, I think Nietzsche actually was kind of funny. Um, you know, like writing chapters like why I am so smart. <laughs> I think that's taking a big risk, but he, you know, um, he pulled it off. And from what I've heard, many consider him one of the great German prose writers ever but i just don't i don't think schlotterdijk is in his class i think he's um he's very talented uh and has a certain charm but it's pretty thin um i i did read though i picked this up and i i didn't get through all of seven but i i thought i'd just take a little rest from it and i picked up another one of his books and uh he has a, a chapter on grand narratives. And I just want to, it's like one sentence, he sums up uh, what we're reading. Uh, he says, 
the author asks the reader to believe him that he finds the endism and ultimism of the apocalyptic features, pages no less ridiculous than do their weariest readers. A last orb was not discussed out of any intention to perform a philosophically distorted Western. The grand narrative of the encounter between being and circle, however, was intended to provide the background for an elucidation of why terrestrial globalization does not merely constitute one story among many. It is, as I mean to show, the only period play in the life of specifically discovering peoples that deserves to be called history or world history in a philosophically relevant sense. Okay, so it's a, the grand narrative of the encounter between being and circle. And this isn't just an, uh, one story among many stories. It's sort of like the story. <clears throat> but I, 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 we just finished the Gidley uh, essay, and she talks about planetarization and future and the integral. And, and he, he's talking about globalization. I think like a sort of typical buzzword, you know, um, capitalist uses it. I think globalization is a, is a buzzword for capitalism, really. And, uh, and a particularly, I think, a very virulent form of it has emerged. Some are calling it cannibal capitalism. Um, but I think he's not, he seems to be above all of that, you know. I don't, I don't know. I, I just, I'm just very curious about the choice of words here, the choice of vocabulary. But what, is, what is globalization? what is planetarization and i find planetarization the authors that i'm most drawn to are using planetarization as uh, as a different as a different choice from globalization and they mean something very different and i think that uh another way i've been looking at this and i may be wrong um but it's the best i can do is to have some sort of strategy to organize myself when i'm reading him I think that uh, Gidley, or is it, it's Erin Gar, she quotes a philosopher who talks about the fork in the road, you know, the bifurcation point between the deconstructors and the reconstructors. And the, the deconstructors went like Nietzsche did, uh, you know, against critical of Hegel and the, and the, the reconstructors are those who moved towards uh, Whitehead and James and process they were sort of wanting to continue that Hegelian uh, effort towards, you know, reconstruction. So I think that dynamic is somewhere he's in, I feel like he's somewhere in between, but I think he moves much more towards deconstruct, taking things apart, uh, ad nauseum. For, and I'm waiting, as I, I mentioned to, in a conversation I had previously with TJ and Doug, I'm waiting for the reconstruction some sort of attempt, and I don't think he, maybe that's going to happen in the next volume. Uh, but that's my frustration. It's, uh, you know, I just feel like this, he, he, he is a very, uh, he, he, I feel like he's, it's like the dance of Salome, and he has seven veils. Take off one veil, there's another one. Take off another veil, there's another veil, you know. And it's the strip tease. You know, you think you're going to get to something really sexy, but it just doesn't seem to happen. But there's a, there's a seductive quality, which uh, I think he reminds me of, you know, remember Lolita Humbert Humbert? The, 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 uh, you know, he's a very charming conversationalist, and he uh, very erudite, very suave kind of guy. And you get into the novel and you realize, oh, he seduces this woman and murders her so he can sleep with her teenage daughter. <laughs> and you're reading this and you're saying, oh, this guy, I shouldn't trust anything this guy says, but you continue reading him anyway. And I feel he's a, I think that's a example of a very unreliable narrator. But I, unfortunately, I think uh, Peter, for all of his charm and, and um, cosmopolitan charisma and everything, I think he's very unreliable. I don't know uh, where he stands on just about anything. So I can't think of anything more. Uh, he, he wrote a book after God. I can't think of anything less likely what I want to read than 
Peter Schlotterdijk talking about what's after God, <laughs> since I have no idea what he means when he uses a word like God, um, <clears throat> since he uses it in such different ways in this book. Um, so anyway, I think it's been a real exercise in you know, trying to uh, keep pace with uh, what's going on here. But like Aaron Gar says, I think uh, he, he says uh, in, a, in a brief video clip that he thought Europe was nihilism incorporated. And he thought that the humanities had basically um, destroyed themselves. <clears throat> and I think that uh, that may be very harsh. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we, with such smart people like, like Schlotterdijk, seems to be just spinning his wheels in this. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a happy camper. Because I thought it was going to, I liked the first book, but this second book has really, to me, got stuck in a ditch and he's just spinning his wheels. But, but, <laughs> he, he, he. Um, he is sharing in that critique of the nihilism of the humanities and the nihilism of yeah you know, culture. Like he's part of the cr the critical kind of wing. That's you know he he seems aligned with with that uh, more libertarian, more uh, uh, conservative uh, approach. I mean, I think he's asking a question actually. Uh, we, we've we've talked about it in another topic. He's asking what is required for a society, something like that. Like he's not, not, not he's not using that term. He's using the sphere idea, the sphere shape. A society is some kind of a sphere, but I think he's asking what the conditions for the pot, for the act, the possibility and or actuality of a society are. And he sees, according to that article, New, uh, um, New Yorker article, that uh, that that postmodern humanities nihilistic cultural sort of emergence coming out of the '60s and, and, and after is consuming itself. It is it is not uh, able to sustain a coherent society. He's looking to the history of Europe for some uh, signs, images, ideas that, that I think he could be used in some form of reconstruction. But then where he really lines up with what that reconstruction looks like, that's what I think is problematic. Uh, I, that Whatever his program is, uh, it doesn't taste that good. You know, that, that, that part of it seems suspect uh, to me. It seems foul. Uh, and so this is where maybe there, there's some learning, something I'm, I'm, I'm learning and maybe a maturing I'm, I'm having in my thought with respect to like this whole fork in the road that European thought took uh, around the time of Nietzsche. Because we as we discussed uh, on Tuesday, uh, Steiner knew Nietzsche. Steiner helped to organize his archives. Uh, and there was, there was uh, a... Um, you know, a nexus there, a cross current of thought, one of which went into this notion of the end of, you know, the death of God and the collapse of the spheres and the decline of Western civilization and so forth. Uh, and I think Sloterdijk is still there. Like there is no, he, he, nowhere does he affirm the beingness of an actual sender. All the messages, all the couriers, the apostolic emanations, etc., they're all ultimately empty in this chapter. Uh, I, there's no expression of, no excavation of, no representing of uh, uh, anything but empty sig signs. I, I don't. So, so, but that other fork which you you point to, Steiner, uh, Gebser, I think would be a exponent uh, of that that current of thought. Certainly, Arabindo. Uh, Bergson, Bergson, James, Whitehead, right. which, which are going in that direction when we're reading the minor gesture, uh, because Aaron is Aaron Manning is a, a definitely a Whiteheadian to some mm -hmm. extent. 
Although she draws on Deleuze and a lot of other people. So. But yeah, but but this 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 fork, you know, this is seen as lesser, perhaps. It's not as philosophically sophisticated, or it's not regarded as that by you know the, the university. Yeah, uh, and it's not that people don't study Steiner or Gebser, but it's really niche studies. It, it ha- it's not like the mainstream of the humanities, uh, and so maybe we're just coming to the dead end of that particular fork. White, and, Whitehead may be more mainstream, but he's still considered extremely difficult for so people. Don't right. But, he, but he's definitely in that reconstructed phase. Yeah. He's trying to put something together. Um, I've been reading that, um, I don't know on which reference it was, on what, what site one of, the, one of the links went to a comparison between Aurobindo and Whitehead, and I've been reading that. Uh, I find that very yeah. interesting. Because oh, uh, Eric Weiss has written yeah. a lot about Whitehead and Aurobindo and Gebser. He, he looks at both of them. If you check out his website, he's got tons of our essays on them. Yeah. So he, he, he definitely views Whitehead and Aurobindo as two parallel yes. orientations towards this constructivist approach rather than the deconstructive stuff that we're in here, I think. But, I, I, you know, reading the article, I, I, what, what I was struck by in the article was... While one may, okay, so when one reads Slaughter Dyke, there are things one agrees with and there are things that one doesn't agree with. But there is a kind of a larger argument where you can say, okay, I get the argument. But then when you hear him spouse off about current affairs and about what's going on, some of what he says I think is brilliant and some of it I think is so full of shit <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know. I don't want to even be in the same room with a guy saying this stuff. You know, so so a bit like you say, he's unreliable yeah. in his in his current affairs kind of uh, uh, talking. He just spout, spouts off all sorts of stuff, and some of it's good and some of it's bad. But it tends to have a more conservative bent to it. I, I find. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm, it, it takes me back to his text a little bit like I did with Heidegger when I got into, first looked at the Heidegger and I thought, oh yeah, this is really interesting. But the guy became strong with the Nazis. So there's got to be something in his writing about being in time that has some relationship that allowed him to go that direction. And it gave me a different view when I went back to look at Heiger. I started to pick out some of those things. And, and I think I'm doing the same with Sloterdijk. I'm now realizing that there is a, be- uh, I mean, even though he denies the conservatism in terms of really right wing stuff when he actually, when he's actually asked about it, there is some of that in his thinking and it, causes me to go back and reread, re-look at the text that we're, we're looking at with a little bit of a more critical view. It's hard because it's all metaphorical and so he doesn't actually come out and say anything about the stuff, about values in that way. I want to be concrete about this because there is, and I also want to hear what you think, TJ, because um, we haven't heard from you yet. But there's the issue of, say, immigration or refugees. Germany taking in large quantities of refugees. The 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 debate around that issue in in German in the German society, you know, sphere specifically. Uh, and you know, he made a comment to the to the effect, according to this article, that uh, that you know, no no nation or no society has the obligation to destroy itself. Uh, in other words, a conservative perspective against allowing in more refugees and accommodating them, uh, the more humanitarian uh, point of view, the more liberal point of view that Merkel was you know, seen as, as taking up. Um, so, I mean, that, I, I think that, I mean, that's, 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 a, top, that's a topic we can discuss. Like that's a, that's, uh, there, there's room for healthy 
debate uh, on the pros and cons of uh, immigration policy or refugee policy, et cetera. Like at, at that level, at the political level, certainly there could be a, a conversation about that. And there is in, in these different contexts. What, what I wonder about is what is his larger project? Because he seems to want to preserve and protect and conserve a German state, German society, whatever that whole, that entire sphere, spheric, he sees that there's a threat Seems to, he seems to be saying there's a threat from allowing the others in because the system couldn't, the system, the society, culturally, economically, perhaps in all ways, couldn't sustain it. Now, they, that, I could see that, I could see that argument um, you know, being made and being a serious argument that, that you know, could be. Um, I'm trying to be careful here because it's obviously a contentious issue. Um, perhaps what he's doing is provoking a conversation that wouldn't otherwise happen. But what I wonder is, what, what is his ultimate horizon? Does he care about planetization? Or is he more uh, concerned with each particular sphere taking care of itself? Like, What is the larger horizon he's actually thinking towards? A, a, a Steiner or a Gebser, a, a, a Teilhard, is, is really situating their thought, situating their project within that planetary or cosmic horizon. And so those more regional, local, national issues are really part, part of, they don't tend to, I think, collapse into a conservatism on that political spectrum because they're really seeing that this as part of a larger emergent process that's m much more founded on the unity of, of beings then on their separateness from each other in different regional groups. So that's where I'm, that's where I don't know where, where sort of like really, uh, where he really aligns himself. Because I, I don't myself uh, recognize the legitimacy of those political divisions. Now, I see a universal humanity, a universal beingness. And I would want my politics to align with the, you know, the, the ultimate emergence of, of that uh, kind of that, that kind of state of affairs. That doesn't preclude societies and local concerns and all kinds of spheres w within it, but but I'm not committed to, you know, uh, an ethnocentric sphere, uh, ex except to the fact to the extent that I am. But we, so um, it's, it's part of, a, it's part of a, a larger, I think, philosophical view, you know, and this is what a, an integral view sort of articulates is how you could have holonic types of relationships, how you can have more complex types of relationships between different uh, contexts and different poles of subjectivity. So now we're still in the monospheric and we're, we're still in the center, you know, the, there's only one center in this whole narrative. But we're way beyond that. And so we need a, we need a vision of philosophy for a multi-centric, polycentric world. That, that's what I'm hoping we would get to. Uh, so uh, I would love to hear what you think, TJ. I've... Still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I, I think it was the New Yorker article, um, Slaughter Dyke answered one of the objections um, somebody from the audience had, had objected to something he said, and he, he responded that uh, not everybody's ready to accept the responsibility of billions of brothers and sisters, not really ready to identify with humanity, you know, in that way. I, for, I forget the context. I just uh, had read the article um, earlier today. Um, so when you say there's room for debate, that's that's really true. I mean, when you're talking, what are, we are, we here in North America, Jeffrey's in Canada. What you know, we're we're Americans. We're North Americans. This idea of multi-ethnic, you know, coming together of, of people who can be genetically from everywhere in the world, we come together under a creed and we make that work. And when you go to the old world. 
Europe, Africa, Asia, these are very, very much older cultures than ours. These are very much more ethno-linguistically set places. So, um, whereas I'm with you, Marco, as kind of looking at a humanity and, or, or pushing those arguments or, you know, at least arguing for those things, we're talking about cultures where there's a real fear of, of the identity. The, the identity is not a creed. The identity is not um, a belief in freedom or a belief in, you know, the, the, so the cohesion that comes from having a common purpose. The identity is truly, you look like me. <laughs> you have the, you know, this is the color hair that we have in this part of the, you know, the world. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Mm. Do you think it's, it's uh, like a proof? I'm going to use the P word. Like, is it a privilege to, to to harbor like idea universal ideas in this time? Good question. I mean, again, you know, do do is it? Yeah, you know, is it a, some kind of heart, hierarchical rank that if you're able to think in terms of humanity, that makes you better or more forward thinking or more evolved? If you know, we throw those words back into the mix again, than someone who's who's not you know, or someone who's, uh, quote, stuck in, you know, earlier forms of cultural identity. Mm. I was talking with two historians in Quebec uh, the, this last week, and they were mentioning to me that there was a moment in Quebec City's history where there were 45,000 people who had established themselves in the city and had an ongoing community that had been going on for a number of years. And then it's, it's a, a, bit, a, a group of boats arrived and debarked 90,000 people. So Quebec, so you can imagine that, so, you know, if the, the refugee crisis we're talking about are nowhere near as dramatic as that in the sense. Uh, and yet Quebec came out of that whole process of integrating these massive, you know, obviously it was a very different time, but, but, uh, uh, Quebec survived and flourished within that context. Uh, so anyway, I thought it was a very interesting comment because of course there's a certain current of current Quebec uh, politics, which is um, much more conservative in its values and is, is throwing up his arms and saying, we can't accept any more refugees, you know, so. But uh, to come back to your point, Marco, about uh, Sloterdijk seems to be want to defend a German kind of uh, nation, and yet, if you re in this chapter, he talks about this idea that the German fascination with German imperialism was grounded in tenth century, you know, in a long background of history, and that in a sense, it is. Um, not exactly illegitimate, but not necessarily appropriate to the modern era. And that's, you know, at, did I get that because I read that in, or was it actually in the text? Oh, I, I think he's amply demonstrating the uh, failure of that imperial project. <laughs> he's, I mean, I think that's what this whole text is about. Uh, I, I've, I've thought of it in terms of a post-mortem for that idea. Uh, and part of what I hear him saying, you know, when I, when I, you know, to the most generous I can interpret like his comments is that it's a way of, you know, I'll take care of my affairs. You take care of yours, live and let live. Uh, let's, you know, none of us, you know, try to take, take over the, the whole world. And uh, there's some, I think, call to or affirmation. You know, affirmation of self-responsibility, self-accountability, self in the sense of the the social self, or the the, the even at the nation level. I mean, you know, he hang he f hangs out with all the the politicians in, in Germany. They're they're buddies. They go out, and, you know, have lunch together, and uh, as is uh, maybe not Merkel anymore. I suppose she's she's gone <laughs> beyond beyond, uh, beyond his sphere, uh, but. Right. I mean, they're, they're all, they're the same class, right? They're all the same group. But I'm starting to wonder, 
because Globe started out very well. We started out with the hearth and we started out with the tight knit social circle around the, you know, the communal fire. And then we went to the city wall. So I'm wondering if is, is that, where he draws the line is that was that bad or was then the ancient empire bad or was the Roman, you know, more cosmopolitan empire bad or what, you know, what, what, where's that line? Where's I, I, I think you're right about the postmortem line, but I'm wondering where he's actually drawing it in this whole thing. But you, you mentioned last time, TJ, um, the, the question about being performative and making a, a it's a performance. Um, I think that I think in the first volume and the first uh, couple of chapters of this volume, there seemed to be a historical attempt to sort of uh, uh, I could find a historical um, thread um, going from you know to to, to nomadic and to you know uh, agriculture to cities states you know to to gods, to, and then to uh, the, the you know polytheism and monotheism, and I, I could sense there was a, you know he was laying it out, and each chapter sort of had something like, you know, two or three, uh, sort of, it was a thread between two or three you know unified sections here, but I think he's he got more into I feel like he's just goofing off this last two chapters he's just being the, cl the class clown i feel like and i'm reading i sorry. feel like i'm oh no go ahead yeah i just think he's just goofing on us and if we take him seriously i think we're <laughs> we've been he's pulled it over and he's pulled it off i might not go as far as clown but i definitely get the sense that i'm reading someone's unedited unedited notebooks yeah, you know, and especially this, this, especially this last chapter, and you know, maybe you know, it's been a little hectic <laughs> at work and stuff, but I just, it, it was a real slog, just a real trying to get through. I have my own unedited notebooks about globalization right now. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to read th someone else. Things I'm kicking around right now, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 but there was a thread in the first three chapters. I, I agree with that as well. There was a there was a progression to that. Um, and again, so now seven, we're we're looking at emanations from Rome, either the you know the emperors of the Roman Empire themselves or the church that you know took in uh, took that place and you know the, the new Rome. Um, and we just went like 150 pages of kind of going over that same point in, in slightly different ways. And I just didn't, I, sh I should have picked right up, oh, wow, the, you know, the Byzantines and the Holy Roman Empire and, and, the, and the whole you know, idea of, of Western Europe and its formation, but it's just <laughs> couldn't, couldn't enjoy following it. Yeah. And I'm, you know, but Marco's, you know, going back to his point about just, how these things are temporary, how these things can't be expected to go last forever because you can't always count on the representative representing your, you know, your, your message or your central authority correctly, or the room that you leave for interpretation, which kind of, you know, we translated the message, so we've kind of diluted it. Um, but, you know, like Marco said, we, we knew that already, right? Yeah. You know. There are, I mean, there, there's something about the story that he's telling, though, that, that is like ontogenetic, where if we're looking at something today, like a hyper object, like the surveillance state, right, or global techno capitalism, something like that. What I think is interesting about this book is that he's showing how those structures the, the, the actual structures, like the relationships between you know, sender, courier, or apostle, road, uh, representative, sign, seal, uh, the, the way that presence becomes projected, right, from some center of power to all the points around it. it it's very, to me, it's the, the, the philosophically interesting part of this, just the enjoyment of like the art of what he's doing is seeing how 
that really starts to happen in this formal systematic way like the form of it is 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 emergent right at this point where the problem arises of how you maintain control across diverse regions diverse populations from a single point of authority like and uh and then like but if you transpose that to the global situation we're st- we're still working on that. Like that's still uh, an, th- 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 that the impulses to um, organize things this way, uh, the, the same shapes, right, are recapitulated in the nation state, in the corporation, uh, in the social network. Uh, we have these central nodes that are in essence have solved some of the problems around relaying, right, around. Um, integrity of the message uh, around the security of the message, but not, not, not exactly because then you get the, you know, even if you have encryption, you can get hacked. Uh, we're, we're recapitulating the same patterns, right? But now truly on a global level, like the, the, the Roman empire wasn't truly global. They thought they were, but they hadn't yet, disc- disc- you know, they didn't yet know about the rest of the, 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 act, you know, the actual planetary terrestrial sphere uh i think it's instructive to look back to the these these kind of origin points because we can see that oh we haven't actually got beyond that 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 structure like we're still relating to these central points that emanate power to us you know and that make themselves present in our existences and we still also divest ourselves of our own in a sense agency our own message i mean it's it's much more complex of course than just having a you know the the, the vatican calling the shots or the the, the holy roman emperor call it whoever it's really more complex than that now but the same dynamic seems to be occurring and so it leads me to think about well that doesn't work right that that's that, that that's that's an uh that can't work on a total in a total way so what how would we reconfigure that? Like, how would we rethink emanation in a polycentric world? Uh, and where, what's emanating anyway? Like, where's that coming from? What the hell is emanation? It's coming um, from your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so as a historian, of course, I agree with that, you know, going back to the origin points for, you know, illumination of of the current problem all right so maybe the question is do we want to continue this pattern that we've had since the beginning of ancient times and the need to have a control center from a state from a city state on up but isn't he kind of moving towards this idea of saying that's the old model and we're leaving it behind and perhaps and we have no idea what's coming up, but we know this won't work. In the, and it's, it's certainly not in the same ways that it's, it has before. You're often so, also along the same lines of what Marco was saying. This, I found there was some in- interesting... Now, again, I never know whether it's because I'm reading into it or whether it's actually in the text because, because I possibly, you know, because I, have a, I bring a lot to the reading and so I don't know how much is him and how much is me, but... I got this, this, in, in, this interesting discussion about the transparency of the messengers and how so the messengers who become, um, who bring themselves into it. And what he talked about was the whole role of corruption, but corruption in a modern polit- political situation. So, and he also had this equation between evil and corruption. So in these systems, in the system of emanation, Evil is the corruption of the messengers. It was very different from other notions of evil. And I found that kind of thinking interesting. I also found the suggestion, because at some point he says that the, because the transparency can never work, that a real system, in a real world system, you can never get fully transparent messages and that's obviously the whole Facebook scandal is part of that 
realization and even in our technological fast world there is no transparency in the telecommunication system either it's it's all um opaque it in it, 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 it has various opacities in it and the opacities are part of what's interesting about the way these systems work it's if it was just transparent it would be dull in a way it would be and it would be too fast because the slowness comes from the opacities of the system as well. So um, I, I think, so I get those kinds of things. He asks questions that raise those kinds of issues for me when I read his stuff. And so I go off into all sorts of thinking about these. I started thinking, gee, maybe there are circumstances in which political corruption is actually a good thing for society. It's not something <laughs> I'd ever thought about before. Um, you know, and so I, I find it rich in terms of the way, if the kinds of, of thinking that I get, get out of it, but they're more the spin-off thinking that I do rather than the actual reading itself. Hmm. We had the same problem with bubbles though. Yeah problem or advantage, whatever. About, yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I remember ha having that question. I, I said, well, I, I sometimes feel like I'm, I'm projecting my own stuff onto this text. And now I'm beginning to, to think that that's what he wants us to do. I don't think there's a direction that he's going in. He's more than willing and, and able to see if your, whatever your projections are. So I think this is a, a lot about just free, it's a free association, free association exercise. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's sort of, a, that's fine with me. I wish I'd known that. Then I wouldn't have been, you know, frustrated. I could just say, okay, I, and I, which I did today. And I read them in small doses throughout the day uh, without taking notes, you know, just like I was reading the New York Times, you know, it's just, and, and when I treated it like that, it was easy to get through or easier to get through than if I was like trying to make sense or trying to find a, a through line or some sort of arc. I think he, he suggested that in other chapters and uh, but now I'm beginning to think he's he's perfectly happy to do what you're doing Jeffrey it's just spent and I think he's writing that very suggestive open-ended uh, um, there's no closure anywhere mm. which and it's I you said it was light uh, Marco you saw it was light and heavy I think it's fluffy rather than light <laughs> Lots of cloud, fluffy clouds floating by on a summer day. <clears throat> um, and I think the language is very fluffy. Yeah, it's, it is, it does have kind of fascination, I grant you, but it's a, but to me, it's just the, it's like a, pr a pretty sort of surface that's just um, comes and goes and shimmers for a little bit and then disappears and comes back. But I don't get any, I don't, I, I don't, I don't find any sort of nutrition in this. A lot of so would you, would you say it's foamy? Then? I would say whipped cream, <laughs> whipped creamy. Creamy. <laughs> With a lot of little sugar on top. But anyway, I, you know, I think it's fine. I'm just, you know, I guess I was just expecting from three gigantic tomes, something, you know, like a, something with a with a message what do we know about the strong relationship that we didn't know before we started this exercise what do we know about fear of the monstrous that we didn't know before we started this exercise what do we know about the need to create ideological and political interior spaces that we didn't know before we started this 
Well, those are very good questions. Um, I I don't know if this is related to my reading of this, but I I went to a you know a professor at Yale who does um, um, modern European history, and I'd seen I'd seen these this course before. I can't remember his name, Meredith or something. John Mary, I can't remember his name. But uh, he just he he goes from he, he spent, and then he, then he has a it's European history and modern European history, the First and Second World War, he pays attention to, and uh, the beginning of um, the end of the Soviet Union. And then he, and he also has one on French history. So I, I viewed both of them. And, 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 you know, I'm familiar with the First World War and the Second World War, but every time I hear those stories and the statistics and the, you know, the trenches and the barbed wire and the massive loss of lives, and uh, you just can't, I don't think it, it sunk in. What a huge trauma that, uh, that was and is continuing to be. I, I, had, I, do, I do not think we are over it. And of course, Americans and Canadians and, you know, other peoples and Australians, they were over there as well, uh, fighting that, that, those wars. So anyway, that is my feeling. I think he may be a bit of a trickster sometimes and a little flippant and a little uh, veiled because I think it's, um, I think it's, he's, a, he's suffering from post-traumatic stress. I really do. And I think he's not um, going to come clean. You know, I, I think he's just, it's uh, well, there's Bob, a and Bob and Weave, Bob and Weave. You know, just like Heidegger did, and um, and uh, you know, all that genius and all that talent just went down the tubes. <laughs> well, there, there's a generational aspect to it for sure. Uh, that comes out in the New Yorker article, uh, in, and in particular in the uh, exchange or the controversy between Sloterdijk and, and Habermas. Uh, Habermas being of the generation. Post, the post-war uh, generation that's reckoning with the aftermath of you know, what the culture had regarded as a, a grand tradition, poets and philosophers and the Enlightenment and so forth. Uh, and, but Sloterdijk was born 47. They called him uh, rubble, rubble, rubble generation, rubble children. Yeah. And he, 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 uh, it's a bit of a low blow, but when Habermas criticized Sloterdijk, uh, you know, for fa- fascistic implications in his in his writing, uh, Sloterdijk, uh, and I hate just gossip. You know, engaging in a sort of <laughs> gossip, which I think this might be, be but uh, you know, accuse him of being o- overly prudish or vir- virtuous. You know, to 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 compensate for the sins of the, uh, of, of their fathers. Right? He's saying like, I'm beyond those false pieties or, you know, that, that sense of rectitude, uh, moral, you know, up, uprightness to, to right the, the wrongs and to, like, he, he's introducing a, a sort of, I don't know, he's jabbing at that. Uh, he's wanting to maybe to loosen up uh, that, that kind of um, over-seriousness or uh, that what might have become a rigidity in, in some, some forms of thought. I see him perhaps playing a cultural function. Like, you know, we're here on the other side of the ocean, right? So th- we, we share a different context, uh, culturally, language-wise, etc. Uh, he's not famous to me. Like, uh, the one, he, he seems to have quite a bit of renown uh, in uh, the German-speaking world in, in Europe. And so he's playing a, a game perhaps there uh, he's touching, you know, pushing certain buttons uh, that, you know, don't really resonate with us. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think that I mean, this review of cultural history that he's doing, this return to uh, the kind of origins in, in Greco-Roman um, you know, universalist and, and imperialist thought, and how that then you know fuses with the Christian uh, 
you know, the, the Christian movement, right? That I, I, I'm taking it from a little bit too high level, but no, it's projects I mean, of that, universalism, right? I mean, his, this, is kind of, this, this is an important topic, let's say, like in the European culture, in the European culture and civilizational experiment. Like he's 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 uh, um, responding to that, I think. Uh, yeah. And I think there's a reason for for the, for the way that he's going about it that that you know we may not be giving him credit for or recognizing. I'm just proposing that as an alternative reading. Of, okay. In other words, I was going to go back to the the rebel child kind of generation that he came from, and perhaps he's the most famous rebel child there is. Um, but I'm imagining right now, as I tend to do, Slaughter Dyke playing in the rubble, and maybe he came across um, some bubbles, and that's when he first started this imagination project. But he he saw a clean ground, or not necessarily clean. Obviously, it's rubble, but it, it's a space for imagination. Um, and as a child, he tends to exaggerate. In these books, he clearly states multiple times and recognizes in other writers, this is pleasant exaggeration or this is pleasing exaggeration. I really like what this guy is saying, even if it's not true. And in a, in a world after God, um, he's seeing not necessarily himself as, well, I can take that role and jump in, but he's saying look, anybody can do this here. I've, I've just created a 3000 page mess of whatever I felt like saying. And um, it actually formed into this sphere project. And, but it's hard kind of going back to, we were talking about the conservative elements, the, his, his take on refugees and things like that. He, he has this kind of three, three sided personality where he, he can be viewed as selfish or righteous, self-righteous. He can be viewed at certain times as the mystic, as the, the one that can see into the future, which at times it seems like he might be doing that. But then at the same time, I think his main role within current society is the provocateur, the not necessarily just to instigate comments or to start conversation on both sides, but like this is... This is the way I see the world and, oh, well, you have this comment. Well, here's how I can prove it wrong or here's how I can just shove in some exaggeration and prove to you that it doesn't really matter what we say to a certain extent. And that's why it seems like he doesn't have anything to say. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's amazing that he exists, as the, the one person mentioned. Like, well, his readings are, yeah, he has books, but... It, like it's amazing that this guy exists because he's an anomaly in a certain sense. Um, and it's, it, I, I think the American version is maybe Sam Harris. Um, he has similar views to immigration refugees, um, but Harris is clearly a provocateur. So maybe we don't recognize the intellectual provocateur as much as uh, here in North America, maybe, but um, I, I guess going with the, the refugee comments and things like that and his, his excursus on murdocracy and uh, like he, he wants to, he doesn't necessarily want to preserve just the, the German bubble um, and not let anything in. He, he kind of just wants to go around and ride his bike and eat some really great steak. <laughs> and, but he, he finds time to do all this other stuff on the side and so, but I, I feel like he, he is going somewhere. Can I was, you say that? I was drawn to um, Slaughter Dyke in the first place because of what he, what I'd read about this idea of co-immunity, which is a positive, as I understand it, but obviously it's in the third book. <laughs> <laughs> We have heard a little bit about it, but not very much at this point. 
So I'm still I'm still waiting for my for my stake, I guess. <laughs> well, in a way, philo- philosophically, could we say that he's reviving a certain kind of vitalism, a, a certain way in which there's a motive force, there's a, a spiritual force. He, he's not going to use that language exactly. He's not going to use the language of a Steiner or an openly uh, spiritualistic uh, type of thinker. But like so much of what this chapter is about is who, who believes what. And how does that impact the legitimacy of, of the belief or the message? Uh, there's a whole bit about, about the Jews and about Judaism and how, you know, they really were a thorn in the side to a true believer in the, the Christian message because they should have been in the position to hear it and um, accede to it, and yet they denied it. Yet they denied that good news, and they, in a sense, they 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 falsified the good news. Like there's a, I note I underlined it. Almost the origins of, of fake news are, are 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 here. This might be something we're read, I'm reading into it, but that like that that sense that um, the the integrity, the reality of the message, if that gets compromised. Uh, like there's hell to pay, right? Like that is the or that that's the the beginning of pogroms. That's the that's the beginning of Holocaust. Uh, and so there's something very positive about uh, the deconstruction of that kind of a system. And I like what you said, Doug. About you know, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what we say. And so, like you know, I'm gonna he, he's gonna provoke. Uh, a discourse just to show the emptiness of the presuppositions uh, that his interlocutors uh, are are importing into that discourse. There, there's something like of that provocateur, trickster, uh, undermining of assumptions. I think performance uh, that that he's doing here. I can't appreciate it as much because I'm. I'm not in that context exactly. I'm not addressed by his particular message here to the extent that 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 there is one. But I think that I could, and, and maybe that's my what I'm partially learning here is I think I could appreciate that. Um, and you know, to go back and I think more, more to agree with your approach to this, John. I I think it's kind of a dead end. I think. I think this doesn't go anywhere, actually. He's bringing about a dead end. I, I think he's consciously bringing about a certain kind of death. Yeah, um, and it is a conscious effort. It is, it's not everything is meaningless. It's um, what we did in the past is meaningless. And he is giving hints at um, the, the project that can, can come to fruition. That's all I have to say. That, that just sparked a thought for me, though, because because uh, so you mentioned you just somebody just mentioned meritocracy, which reminded me of that funny chapter. He is defending culture. He is defending. I could tie it back to the strong relationship. He is defending that kind of community that's tight knit, that community that breathes the same air, eats the same foods, creates the same odors when they defecate. And it's, it's not meaningless. It's, it's meaningless for us. It's not meaningless for the people who lived and formed those cultures. The living strains of which we, you know, we kind of look at as nativism or whatever you know we want to call that um that still is real it still is part of our, our politics as we all know so he's he's kind of looking back and looking forward at the same time which i will grant him he, he's he's got that um multi-pronged look at what's going on and and what's what we're trying to what what awaits us maybe in the future or how he's you know setting that up. Yeah. Um 
my objection is that, you know, you can make those points in a lot less words. And I appreciate the art. I appreciate the, you know, the gallery, you know, but it, you just, it, you lose the, the sense of that, that we're going. And then it gets frustrating because you're, you're waiting for a point or you're waiting for a tie and, and you end up having to do that all yourself. You know, I, I, th I think he's, um, I don't know what you guys think about this, but I, I, f I felt for a while there that he was trying to re-enchant the world. And, um, but now I think he's, like you said, it's a, the end of the line. And I think he's joined the disenchanted camp. Um, and the, you know, and, and Leotard and Derrida and Foucault, he's in certainly good company, but I have that's, noticed. That's just for this project though, right? That's just for this yeah, year's project. And we have to remember that. And it's kind of hard since we haven't quite well, I deep think, into all the other stuff. No, I, well, the disenchantment, I think comes out of, um, certainly the trauma of two world wars and then there's the Vietnam War, uh, uh, the traumas that we've endured. But I think that the, this uh, nihilism incorporated that uh, Aaron Garr was talking about, I think comes out of this, this uh, I think is, uh, the, the myth of disenchantment is, I'm wondering about that. I, I get the feeling from recent readings I've done from other people that most of humanity is in an enchanted world, except for a handful of academics in, you know, Western universities. But there's most, most people have some belief in the paranormal and the magic. It's especially working class people. Um, and, you know, it's that, and I think that a lot of his, uh, this orb issue and globalization and the guilt for, of uh, colonialism and imperialism and the, the, all the blood on his hands that Europe has, I think it's a, a heavy burden for some of them. And we have our own burden here as well. But I think, I, you know, if you soften your eyes and you look at, and you find that little weenie dog between your fingers. Have you ever done that before? If you soften your eyes and sort of let them cross, and your periphery, your peripheral vision starts to expand, and you just sort of soften your boundaries, become aware of the curves in your body, like the curve of your, your neck and your, your, your pelvic cradle, the arches in your feet, the curve of the earth beneath you. And just imagine for a moment that the world is a garment that you are wearing. This is a very, and when you go to sleep at night, you dissolve, disappear, have dreams. I think this is, this is where um, the medieval peoples, people in the Middle Ages were. That, you know, the, they were not standing, the earth was not a platform that they stood upon. It, it was much more like Owen Barfield said, a garment that, that they would wear. And I think the people in China, people in Africa, I think this is a common experience. But I think it's this pocket of intellectuals who are very cognitively advanced and cut off from the neck down. Um, that have lost that somatic intelligence, which is, which is, you know, all around us. But I think that's what I'm getting, is he's um, very cognocentric and very up in his head and uh, very uh, focused on the past and his um, obsession with this um, kind of Euclidean geometry that, uh, you know, this orb, this history of the orb is just obsessive. But, it, you know, maybe he gets over it when he has a couple of beers, you know, 
sings a few songs with his pals, he can drop all that crap. I have a feeling he is a, has a lot of fun when he's not, when he's not doing this stuff from the reports in the that the, you know he sounds like he's a you know he had a birthday party and all the celebrities were there hosting him. Bruno Latour was writing a poem about him, and you know he seems to be a grand old man having a good time. But it's I don't know I I just find this. Um, I, I just think it's a lot of phony, phony baloney stuff going on here. Yeah. I'm going to be very interested in seeing chapter eight, which will, you know, and then after that, I'll, I'll be ready for a break. <laughs> just yeah. from the wording. But um, it, you, you brought up disenchantment. You brought up the world wars a couple of times, John. Um, as an aside, if you guys want to really get depressed, Martin Gilbert, the historian, wrote two books, The First World War and The Second World War. And in it are not the grand stories of strategy and Patton's tanks and what armor. It's like a chronological walkthrough of the death counts and the villages wiped out and the battlefield casualties. And and it's (laughs) what you say, disenchantment. That was the, the, the optimism of the 19th century, Europe was on top of the world in 1914 and in 1945. And when the rubble children started, you know, by the, by the end of that period, you know, disenchantment's probably too soft a word. No, it's despair. <laughs> that was, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, legitimately so. That was all, that was really, and, and not to make light of Canada and Australia and, and the United States, we sent soldiers in there, they suffered, they died. My grandfather was in the Pacific. Um, we kind of looked at that from afar. We weren't in the maelstrom. We weren't, um, you know, you think about the Eastern Front, and I won't go in, you know, further, but, you know, that was, we weren't right sitting in the middle of, of all that. But these are people who had to live through that, and the survivors had to kind of try to rebuild the world. I'm not surprised at postmodernism. I'm not surprised at, you know, the kind of deconstructive bent that, that followed all of that. And we- only, go ahead. No, you're right. I, I think actually um, the United States benefited from the, the end of the Second World War. We, we had were, the only industry that was up and running. <laughs> all the artists, I mean, you know, Schoenberg and Thomas Mann and all these Jewish intellectuals, Hannah Arendt, all these musicians that, that mm-hmm. filled up all the American orchestras. We were huge. We, America was culturally a beneficiary of a that exodus. So uh, we've been searching yeah. for the good war ever since. <laughs> yeah, and we had a boom, a huge boom. And the, the 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 veterans who came back, they were given free education, and uh, yeah. <laughs> the education level. And basically, they were afraid. All these soldiers come back, and they don't have a job. Let's put them all in school, you know, and, and retool. And they that was a very successful decision that they made. Um, so we were the beneficiaries of, uh, of that. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a very different history but I, than, than it is for us. I think uh, to some extent we underestimate the impact of that on North America because we have... Oh, yeah, I didn't want to make light of it completely, but yeah. Uh, TJ, we have this feeling of distance here, but um, one of my writing projects has been looking into the Second World War and its impact on modern life. And I talk to a lot of people in my, just people that I meet. And at Mm -hmm. first when I started to do this, I thought maybe I would find a few people with stories, but just about everybody I talk to has stories. Mm -hmm. And they're not, they're they're all troubling stories. And so the troubling stories that date from that period are omnipresent around us, but nobody talks about them. So I think the presence and the impact is much more stronger than we realize, and it would, you know, so. Yeah, great. Well, we also, and I was really, the physical destruction, of course, was, was greater in the war zones. But yeah, you're right, you're right. I do acknowledge that point. We also see it as in the past. And mm-hmm. the, the, I mean, uh, uh, the forces in play then are in play now. Uh, and... Which is funny because we don't see our own civil war in the past. (laughs) Uh, 
true. true. It's different. <laughs> yeah. That's um, kind of where the technology side of it jumps in. We are not in a war at this time, a major war, simply because we, we mentioned the the pain um Dan Carlin before, um, kind of that venting through chat rooms and uh, the trolling and all that is is kind of the the war that's being fought now. The biggest biggest news story is um, Facebook addressing the election. Um, the Russian influence in the election and things like that. In the past, it would have been espionage and actual going to the countries and wars and battles to be had, um, which we we're always on the cusp of that. But a lot of the the physical pain is being experienced in our own head spaces, in our own homes, staring at the light. Um, well, I mean, in proxy zones like like Syria, I mean, this is uh, part of uh, like one of the things Sloterdijk writes about in this chapter. He 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 brackets that idea of a world war. Like he, he sees that as a history, calls it historian construction or something like that. I mean, he seems to be really articulating a sort of ongoing world war, like with these flare ups, these you know grand, like these not grand, but these you know, uh, explosions, right? One, two, but there's still world war going on because there are all these self-referential centers of, of power that are vying for, uh, you know, resources, uh, power, hegemony, what have you. Uh, and, you know, now, of course, we have the nuclear, we have the, the internet, we have AI, we have, you know, emergent nanotechnologies, automated, uh, you know, weaponry. Uh, there's um, well, there, there's a lot of reason I think to 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 suspect that this ain't over. You know, uh, and I I just want to share a piece of news I saw last night. I don't know if it was real or not. Could have been bots that created this, some kind of content factory. You know, in the middle of the Ukraine or something like that. But it was Russian state tv supposedly uh you know t- telling the announcer and i can't understand it, it's all in russian but the story is that he's telling you know the, the the viewers that they should be stocking up on food and water because they're expecting uh you know conflict uh over over syria uh if trump attacks syria Putin may respond, etc. How much of that is real? How much of it is fake news, propaganda, psyops, etc.? I mean, we're in this kind of place where there aren't reliable emanation channels, like to to get truth. Uh, and as if there ever were. I mean, <laughs> in the brain, right. I mean, they were really pervasive. But, but I, I, get, I mean, I get the point though is that the context is different and um you know he he's narrating this history of a spirit collapse but we're still in this bubble you know we're in a much bigger bubble than we were in 19 you know 37 uh and it's a much more volatile bubble uh now and i you know i'm not getting guidance on how to relate to this situation that we're in actually um, on the ground. I'm not getting that here because I think that there's a certain kind of escapism perhaps that Sloterdijk is uh, involved in and it's just endemic to that, you know, to, to the, the, the his group, his class. Uh, the, you know, the, wonderful to enjoy a fine wine, a fine meal and all these things. But if through the, your mediums of, your media of perception, we can see what's happening all over the world. We can see what's happening in Syria. We can see what's happening in Nigeria. We can see it's not, these are not just representations. They're direct perceptions through the apparatus of the global, you know, internet nervous system thing, news sphere. And yet there's people going about their lives as if it's not happening. So that, that's where I find a real, I don't know, weakness or, uh, unconvincing, un, un, uninspiring, uh, you know, aspect to, to, to all this. Nietzsche was different because he was a man in crisis. 
<laughs> you know, like he was a man with a fire under his ass. Uh, and that's why, it, it, you know, he, 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 he can write so much more penetratingly because he's pithy. He gets to the point and he gets to many points, you know, sequentially and the points build on each other, like, you know, explosive devices. Um, so there's a kind of decadence going on here, I think. Uh, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, I love luxury too. I would love to bathe and luxuriate in, in you know, all the fine, uh, the fine uh, lifestyle uh, accoutrements that, that Sloterdijk has access to and the wonderful symposia and the conversation. I'm sure they're, they're wonderful, but like you've said, John, uh, and, you know, like I think current events are bearing out, uh, that's not where the action is. Uh, and, you know, I think there's greater vitality in perhaps being closer to, you know, to what is really happening uh, on a more planetary scale. Uh, I was going to say, how close do you want to be to <laughs> what's going on in some of these zones? Well, you know? yeah. I mean, is, is he pointing out the fact that, you know, yeah, we really do live in two, three separate worlds oh many more than that <laughs> yeah. yeah but you know i, I think I, I i think i phrased it um in the forum you know, there's some of us who can take hot showers or even though john i know you take cold ones but and there's some who are scrounging for drinking water and this is our reality in our world yeah 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 i just remember in the sorrow and the pity the, the wonderful documentary about the the french occupation and um, all these interviews, this old lady, they asked her when, what, what that, the day when Hitler um, came in to Paris, what was that like for her? And she said, well, I remember the, the price of tomatoes were really high. That's, that was it. So it, I don't know, maybe she's just a really stupid person wasn't aware of current events or maybe she was just hunkering down and paying attention to what she needed to pay attention to. <laughs> you know? So I just, I'd think go that, with the latter. Yeah. So I just think a lot of people in unbearable circumstances pay attention to the cost of tomatoes, you know, and how they're going to make ends meet. And I think a lot of people are, are who are in that situation are paying attention and are um, very creative um, under stress um, in a way that I think a lot of people who have a lot more resources are not. So, you know, I'm all for hoping we balance because I think we're insanely out of balance right now. And I think he promotes some of that imbalance when he says something stupid things, provocative things like you were saying, Jeffrey, like, you know, the, the, the poor are bitter because they're not rich and the rich are, are bitter because they have to pay taxes to take care of the poor. Um, I just think those are such cartoonish things to say <laughs> that are not right now very helpful. It's something you would expect Donald Trump to say, you know, <clears throat> but not this uh, highfalutin philosopher. But anyway, he's a, Although, he's a complex there, thinker. He's complex. You know, he's there, not, there's some insight in that though, isn't there? I mean, it's it's simplistic to, to formulate it that way. But I but, don't think it's the poor are angry at the rich because they're not rich. Well, it was and resentment. He was talking about resentment, not money. Or well, he's talking about rage too. Then rage banks, this idea of well, they're 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 mad more. because they're poor because they've been ripped off. A whole generation, my age, was ripped off in the last recession. And, uh, you know, a lot of, and that's not going to come back. So a lot of people's, uh, the futures that they had sacrificed for went down the tubes. And the people who are accountable, who are, have no one's been held accountable. And currently the rich are thumbing their nose at the rest of the world. That also yeah. is creating a lot of good feeling, is it? <laughs> yeah, and he's one of the 1%, I'm sure, at this point. So... Bread prices in Paris were higher than they had ever been in a long, long time. The date was July 14, 1789. Wow. 1789. And you can imagine just people being like, oh, but this is the last straw. 
and you know for those but Bastille Day, you know, if you didn't know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they've 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 sort of the, they've the tie in between the yeah the tie in between the, these that's happening in Venezuela, you know, and, and places where the economy is just crashed. They know there's the percentage point where the if you're a little above that the population may be starving, but they won't fight. But if it goes a, a percentage below that, watch out because they're going to burn down your house. And that's where I think uh, a lot of these nefarious forces are quite willing, you know, to be a, a, a percentage above that place where um, the system would uh, implode. In chaos, there's opportunity, right? Uh well, hey, hopefully, you live in interesting times. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean that opportunistically. I, I mm -hmm. think that there, there are people who, uh, Bannon is certainly one of them. I think Trump in, instinctively is one of them uh, who create d disorder, who further it uh, in, in order to seize on, uh, you know, the opportunities that arise in that kind of, in that confusion. Right. Interestingly, <laughs> Slaughter Dyke said that in the article, though, which I thought was really interesting. I think he nailed the Trump phenomenon anyway in the 2016 election. I think that was some of it. It was that in the New Yorker article also. Right, right. It was a sort clever, of, a clever formula. He called it, he called him an entrepreneur of rage. Something yeah. Like yeah. Rage. Yeah. That was it. A rage entrepreneur. Rage entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm sure it's it was the cool unknown enough. and Clinton. Yes. And yes. they knew Clinton. He was the unknown. And he, and Slaughter said it was, he said he was not surprised no. that people would want to go for the unknown. I wasn't surprised at all. I mean, I was arguing with people on Facebook. They said, play it safe. Go with Clinton. Don't rock the boat. And I said, she's going to lose against Trump. I know because I talk to working class people. I am a working class person. I listen to what they say. <laughs> and she's going to lose. I said that a year before it happened. And when it happened, I was not happy. But I, I wasn't surprised at all. A couple of, um, and well, I'll just throw it in there, a couple of the quotes that I had picked out that I quite liked. Um, this is not him, he's quoting Siegert. The empire is a postal system and the postal system is a war. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> that <whole> yeah. <laughs> postal systems, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, I write little headings right above each page just to remember, and I wrote going postal on that page. <laughs> yeah. that, yeah, and that, that, that's a contribution from the American context, I think. <laughs> and another one that I wrote down, which I really liked, was all history is the history of insolment relations, mm -hmm. which, which could be a kind of subtitle to the entire Spheres trilogy, I think, in terms of the way, what, what, is, what Slurdike is interesting in writing about. But, uh, what, what did he call Hitler? Something uh, something about a, a papist or something. Uh, oh, yeah. Degraded uh, papist. <laughs> a what? A what? Degraded <laughs> papist or something? Oh. <laughs> it was a, a witty repartee. Some... Uh, uh, oh, debased, debased papist or something. <laughs> something like that. And one that we can understand based on chapter seven, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to... I wanna, uh, uh, offer a thought on where this might be going. Everything here depends on this faith. Like the, the message has to be sustained. Like that's what sustains the, 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 the semiosphere. Uh, of course, we know it gets corrupted along the way, intercept, all, all kinds of things happen. It doesn't actually work. But arguably, what Sloterdijk is describing in terms of the expansion of Christianity and imperial Christianity through, you know, the transmogrification of Rome, of the Roman Empire, uh, that turns into modern. That we, we get to modernity. We're going to get to modernity. And where does that faith go? It's not in God. It's not in the absolute center. What if we lose faith in what does our civilization collapse? Yeah, I, I at the very end, I didn't know like the Pope, I also wrote down Dalai Lama, the presidency, that the Dalai Lama has been 
contested that, or the, the most recent one is saying, well, eh, I don't know if there's going to be another one. Uh, so it's kind of this mentality of, oh, well, this has just been a, a fun story we've told and we've had this, this center here for such a long time, but it's just some dude or, or girl or whoever. And same with the presidency. Um, what, what is it other than the, the next, it, there, there is no center. So the presidency is the closest thing we have to a center and we're all recognizing that that center is kind of deflating as well. Um, so magnificently deflating. Yeah. <laughs> or imploding. Supernovas. Well, Doug, you read Harari's Sapiens, right? Correct. So, you know, the, the faith that Marco's talking about has to be kind of linked to these shared fictions that mm-hmm. he's talking about. Um, uh, Jeffrey, you said all history was the history of installment, and I forget what the rest of it was. Installment relations. Installment relations. Back on page 151, he said all history is the history of animations resulting from the division of space by the two, the interior and the exterior. Tying it together, we can't get away from uh, Yuval Harari has pointed out um, all of this. I guess a slaughtered Ikean sphere would be the same thing, a worldview um, from coming from the literature I've read for the past couple of decades, civilization, that whole I- idea of the shared fiction. That we, there's, there's something that we're believing in that props all of this up. But that's something we're believing in is now what happens technology, when, algorithms. Well, that's and, right. It, at it, least it, that's it, what he's going into. Yeah. Well, money, we pass through the money. We're probably going to pass through the money phase in chapter eight. And then combination of money and technology. And then I, guess, I, I just love that line, Gandhi, when they asked him what he thought about Western civilization. He said he thought it was a good idea, mm-hmm. um, but we're always we're, we're grieving for the potential loss of a civilization that perhaps hasn't arrived yet. Um, I wonder if it's grief that we should be feeling. Um, That's what Spangler would say. <laughs> oh, I don't know, I'm Spangler. <laughs> I don't know Spangler. Maybe, maybe I do know Spangler better than I imagined. It, uh, I may have absorbed some of him in indirect ways, even though I've never read him. Can I uh, can I throw a quick spoke that will kind of go off of Jeffrey's prompt of the post slaughtered Ikean? Um, like, can, can we kind of imagine what it would be like after? a post slaughtered Ikean philosophy type of thing. And um, I had some sort of epiphany while driving one day, but it, it navigated around this idea of hibernation, which in a certain sense, we're exploring that with slow time, whatnot uh, here on the cosmos co-op infinite conversations. Um, so I, I didn't examine it as much as I really had hoped to. I kind of lost the, the metaphor, but um so in this post-slaughtered Ikean hibernation, at first I imagined it as extremely science fiction, like we're all in a biome. We all have a personal bubble biome to protect us, even psychologically, if somebody or a troll gets us online, like that will be shut off or that person will be shut off. Or if somebody's arguing with us, or about to throw a rock to, towards us, we would be protected um, whether it's an actual technological bubble or um, there's some brain implant that once somebody gets angry, it shuts them off and says, oh, well, that emotion is not necessarily something you can't feel, but you're, you're really affecting this person and creating trauma. So that's one aspect of it. But so like with bubbles, he explores the heart, the face, the womb. So this, this would be an actual dive into the womb and a really deep, slow thinking, which Slaughtered Ake is clearly good at, although it's not necessarily possibly the best type of, or our preferred, preferred deep thinking, or not as 
integral. Maybe it's self-serving in a certain sense. So yeah, this, this bubble that would form would, would take into account John's microbiomes and kind of create out of that. But I, I couldn't quite grasp what a post globes would be. Like we've gone through the, how death brings us closer, how the, the hearth brings us closer heat and the arcs and the walls and the forming of the spheres. But what, what exactly would this, after it all deflates, after the last orb, like what exactly would it be? But we don't necessarily have to go into that. I was just thinking maybe if we jump that far into the, the future, what, what's the middle ground there? Like where, so th there's quite a bit of technology developing, which it's not going to be some magical sci-fi cure-all, but we can utilize it in quite a few ways these days. So, so there is a I'll stop there, yeah. There is a paternalistic thing, too. So, you know, I mean, it's a bit simplistic, but we're losing the authority figures. Yeah, that's a good point. Saying, we're losing yeah. parent figures. That's right. So in a sense, I mean, the negative view is civilization is falling apart. But the positive way of spinning it is to think about, well, we're graduating from a state where we're dependent on these all these figures, authority figures that tell us what to do to right. something else. What that other thing is, it's hard to figure out. But it's it's a kind of adult. It could be a kind of adulthood, right? In in a in a civilization way. I don't know. Th that's where I think the integral project is more interesting, uh, right. because it, it really is trying. And, and I'm just I'm I'm speaking about integral in the way that Jennifer Gidley does. As this kind of br very broad confluence of thinkers, currents of, in, in thought, philosophy, experiments in consciousness, in farming and all kinds of things, but really trying to imagine what's the next world. You know, what's the world where you know, we, we're not uh, subject to a monarch, you know, in some you know, distant land or in some, on some distant server? Uh, um, I, I, that's, a, that's exciting to me. I think that the, the Solarik doesn't offer a lot visionary wise. No, he doesn't. Like, like, you know, if we wanted that, we could read any number of other thinkers, uh, Buckminster Fuller, any, any. Or a Bendo. Or a ben yeah, who are re envisioning, and not just envisioning, like in Aurobindo's case, actively working to bring that world into being. Um, I think we're, we're, we're slow to like may have a contribution to that uh, is in his appreciation for culture. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last pages here, we were, this came up earlier in the conversation, but um, I thought he, this was cl clever. One of the things I appreciate, little bits I underlined. Uh, he says, one could actually say that religious centralism perished through the legalization of genius. Uh, just as in morphological terms, God's death throes had begun with the positing of the center as ubiquitous and the derealization of the circumference. So, if we don't have priests as the you know official authorized messengers of the divine, uh, where where do we find the divine? And I think that he's saying here that at least he's leaving open this possibility at this point in the text that we find it through genius, we find it through creative acts, we find it through the arts, through literature. Uh, I don't think he sees that like the literary uh, or even the artistic in that old sense as being a world effective kind of force in the same way. Like he talks about that as being like the, you know, part of the humanities and the more of an archival type project, but I don't agree with that. Uh, I, I do like archiving and I, I do think that we could look to the past and to our traditions for resources, but the reconstructive part of genius is to take all that and create something new. Right. I, I, I'm, I need to be a little more cautious. I, I've really enjoyed everybody's uh, input tonight. I think this is, I think we're working hard in this text and it's bringing forward some, you know, questions and some possibilities. And, and it's very difficult. I think, you know, looking for another narrative 
um, or something that we can agree is worth uh, fighting for or believing in or protecting. Um, but I, 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 I'm so drawn to the reconstructive side and so appalled by the deconstructive damage that's been done. And I should have, this is probably Wilbur's ongoing influence, even though I'm uh, disenchanted with Wilbur's world. I think that's a, an influence he's had on me. And now I'm starting to realize it's not going to be deconstruction or reconstruction. It's going to be both, both and and neither nor. So um, I, we're going to be planting seeds and pulling up weeds. Um, and we're going to have to be doing it every day. And I think this is going to be going on for generations rather than getting caught up in too much of one or the other. So, you know, going back to that um, garden metaphor mm -hmm. <laughs> or the jazz metaphor we use. Yeah. Well, yeah. construction is a very yeah. mechanical metaphor. It's, it's, a, it's like the earth is a platform. It's a flat plane. You have building blocks and you build things. You construct. And then when you deconstruct, you take them apart. And when you destruct, you blow them all up. But it's, a, it's not an organic uh, way of thinking. Aaron Manning's idea. So the, she talks about the fact that you have to balance the minor gesture against the major gesture. She's not saying throw out the major gesture. Right. Thing. The major gesture has its role, but the minor gesture is one that we often neglect and we need to pay attention to in order to balance off the other one. So again, it's this kind of fluidity between one mode and the other. And there's always serendipitous events that just emerge out of nowhere that you want to take advantage of. And they, those can have enormous impacts, but they're not necessarily anything you can make happen. It's just being paying attention and um you know i think those i think she 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 referenced some sort of takeover of the student body of the some um uh, some institution i don't know where it was in canada it wasn't over it wasn't publicized too much here but uh, it, she made reference to that takeover the, no it was the quebec um uh, Maple Spring that we had a few years ago. Where right, right. And how no one planned on that. It just sort of happened. It's, it's sort of like the Stonewall Riots in New York, which created the gay movement. Or the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was also a completely spontaneous thing. It, right? it, exactly. But those, the I think, <laughs> but they're not totally accidental. A lot of people have been working underground for a very long time for those kind of uh, opportunities to arise and then there's a shift that happens or so. the french revolution that i mentioned earlier yeah. His, history wasn't planned you know we look back in the books and we look oh this followed this and this but you know the <laughs> serendipity underground work sure philosophy and you know, the philosophs and the, the all the talk that was going on in the salons but you know and then Bread prices go through the roof. People get really ticked off, and the next thing, four years later, the king's dead. You know, so but the same, the same thing. I, mean, I think I said that also in another discussion about the we could be looking at a generational, at a centuries, you know, and that's okay because then it's kind of the slower but surer route. My worry, of course, is you know we can really screw things up a lot quicker than we <laughs> we can build things. So. Right, you know, pushing for it, and also change happens. It tends to happen fast. I mean, even though once it gets rolling, yeah, over a long time, yeah, when right. it actually comes. It happens fast, right? Precipi there's a precipitous pre precipitation, right? Right, like the end of exactly. slavery in the Civil War it took about four years, hundreds right. of years of s slavery, and it was over. Other problems arose. Oh, but, sure. <laughs> yeah, like construction was a nightmare. Um, and we're still feeling the aftershocks of, of a lot of that. Um, but I think we need to, to recall, you know, with gratitude, all the unremembered and unknown people who have sacrificed a great deal, you know, so that we can have this conversation tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and we can, you know, uh, reorganize our behaviors around values that we share. I think 
out of these kind of salons, and there are, I'm sure, lots of them going on all around the globe, that we can, um, you know, work on our language and and how and what we want to have happen and use our imaginations and and get real, you know, about what we can actually achieve. Is Slaughter Dyke asking us to get real by tying yeah. our values into spheres <laughs> and, and, and bringing strong relationships together? Or Yeah, I, I think it's, I want to be generous with him. I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate, but you know, yeah. <laughs> is, is that what's going, it's possible, is that what's going on? I, I think it's a, a not too loose, I like that principle of the, uh, the Errol Flynn, uh, how he uses that sword so beautifully. In his fence, he was a great fence. He said, oh, okay. well, I hold it like a little bird. Hmm. Not too loose, not too tight. And I just think that's a great metaphor for our relationships as well. You know, just not too loose and not too tight. I think Schlatter Dyke is, is, for me, a little too loose. Hmm. Um, but I don't mean that, but I don't know. You know, I, yeah. I just think as a writer, I'm not attracted to this kind of what I think feels really loose to me. Although as a exercise for this group, the readings have been highly productive. For right. Our- True. True. So we've done good work on this. Yeah. I think. I, think so. I totally agree. Um, I, I mean, I, starting a cooperative called Cosmos, like he's, he's talking about the history of that idea. Very, very in very insightful ways, I think. Uh, and so even just in an artistic gesture of constituting anything like that would invoke, you know, that sense, that wholeness that, that I think it's important, very, it's crucial. Actually, I'm finding crucial to be grounded in, in a, in a historical philosophical, like scholarly, even to, you know, to the extent that this is, I don't mean scholarly in the, in the sense of, you know, the formality of it, but in the sense of the erudition of it, uh, I'm finding it invaluable. Uh, actually, and I'm I'm very glad we're doing it, and I'm going to proceed with you know the next chapter uh, forthwith, uh, so that I don't leave it till till the night before. Uh, but before we go, because we're getting kind of to the end, I I do want to talk about this fellow. What was his name? Rock and st- Rosen Rosen Stock Rosenstock. Rosenstock Some interesting been. ideas that suddenly just went south really quickly, uh, <laughs> and. I was like, yeah, this sounds good. Language speaking, this sort of like yeah. revelation <laughs> through human history. And then he's, then it turns into except the people who didn't get it, like the Marxists and the Jews. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, there was something to that I felt, felt that we might recover, uh, this sense of, an, of sort of like, you know, that, that there's an, the, the idea in the, um, uh, the Kabbalistic idea. Of, uh, of history being the weaving together, the stitching together of these cultural fragments of, of Torah. Uh, that's kind of like what I, I felt that like this fellow was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I made a lot of those same connections too with Gidley and uh, Ed's presentation. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. But yeah, it kind of just cuts off all of a sudden there too. What, what was Lutterdyke trying to tell us by bringing this... I mean, well, he does have a quote near the end, which I don't know if it if he believes in it, but it, it's almost a sign that he understands. He he he's clearly integral in a certain sense, but he says Rosenstock finally speaks like a minister of world communications, stating that the purpose of all medial networks is the delivery of the message of love, the message of love, which that's not come up in almost the entire thing, and. But the interpretation of love there seems to be different than just love God or love the center. It's it's kind of because he, he states it as finally speaks like a minister of world communication. So this is a loving creation. Um, even so though I, I found that interesting. Even though the Jews are mixed up with the Nazis and the Fascists. Because, because they, they, they're not because in, in Rosenstock's view, these specific groups are not hearing the message. They're not they're not feeling the love. And and this inspires great hatred. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the irony of it all. I mean, that's that. That's you create a, a a world predicated on universal love, but only for those who believe in the world as you've constructed it. And for those who don't, they fall outside of the outside of that uh, purportedly or presumably uh, total sphere. I. I, I was seduced a bit by Rosenstock. Uh, tell me who is speaking to you, and, and I will know who you are. We are the children of listening. Like I would write that in a poem. Uh, we are the children of listening. That's quite beautiful. Uh, and you know, he brings him Der- Derrida as well as he just mentions him at one point as this negative rabbin, r- negative rabbi. I had a question mark there, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and it made me think, hmm, you know, th- there's really something important about that role, the role of the no, the role that doesn't, you know, that questions presence, that questions the sign, you know, that, that, that doesn't, that isn't seduced uh, by the spirit. Uh, I have to go back and look this up, so don't anybody quote me, but I think Derrida was an Algerian Jew, but he yeah. was in France and he was outside the system, so this kind of universal love, but universe is described as your sphere and your culture, so then if you're on the outside of that, you're not getting the message, but how much is that your fault because you've been pushed outside of that? It's very, it's it's convoluted, but there's a whole... Good. And there's that whole interior exterior thing again. There's that whole, who are you including? Who, who are you, what the limits of your transference? What are you including in your, your part of this sphere? And what are you pushing away? I think he was, a, he was a Arab Jew. He was, Algeria, Jew. He was from Algeria. Algeria. Uh, Algeria. Yeah. I don't know. He if was, he was a very mixed. Yes, culturally. Yes, yeah. Who lived in Paris most of his life, I think. But he, Algeria is another story. Boy, was that complicated. <laughs> I think a lot of in Jewish, there were a lot of Jewish Arab intellectuals, though, who were in that deconstructive, who took that deconstructive path. Um, but the roots of it being like, you know, this is the Western narrative that we're always somehow outside of, you know, not quite accepted in inside the narrative there and then so the questioning of the narrative that's we, all history stuff i won't, <laughs> I won't get like, into that. if we ever do derrida there's one essay <laughs> is that i've tr- i haven't finished it i started it, it on, on telepathy it's one of his last uh essays i think right, sort of right before he died he got really interested in the paranormal hmm. and I, I i i got interested in it because of um who who, who someone it was in the paranormal said that Derrida was into it. And I went, really? I didn't know that. To let the of Derrida that I read that was, I had read him years ago and I never got into him. And then I got into, I, I came across this book cause I was looking up books about singularity. Uh-huh. He wrote a book called the, a taste for the secret. It's actually a joint thing with another writer. Um, but he talks about his Algerian, experiences as a, a Jew and the outsider, all of these issues come back in, but in relation to singularity. So it's a very hmm. interesting text. What was the name of that, Jeffrey? A Taste for the Secret. A Taste for the Secret. Okay. Short. We'll add it to our notes. <laughs> well, I better go in and have dinner. See the, see the girls. Well, I, wanna, I, I think what I've learned from this is that I think our group has a lot of stamina. this is like a year and a half we've been working on this and we're still standing it's amazing some not everyone who joined us at the beginning is still with us but i think those of us who hung in there have demonstrated that we have a lot of stick to itiveness and now we're going to read our window we're going to need stick to it. <laughs> yeah no, i'm glad I, we've built up some muscles for there sure <laughs> <laughs> well this is the dojo of reason so you know, right. that's good. <laughs> what's that the sword <laughs> like a bird. sword of manjushri <laughs> all right well Thanks, thank you so much that always was, a pleasure gentlemen Thanks. Conversation. i really i really appreciate that thank you lots of fun thank you all right good night
Good night, guys. Hey.